good afternoon or good morning, good evening, wherever you are. It's really lovely um, to be with you all today. You can't tell, um, but it's a lovely afternoon in Ithaca, which I think is how you know it's reunion um, because the weather is so nice and it's like the first time that it's been nice, maybe all spring. So I wish we could all be here together in person for this panel. Um, but given that we can't be together in person, it's so nice to have this opportunity to get to speak to you um, and to get to share this panel today. The panel today is on migrations or the movement of people, plants and animals. And we're going to have to include, of course, microbes and the context in which they move. Migrations is the focus of the university's first Global Grand Challenge, which is an initiative that we launched last October. The Global Grand Challenge brings students and researchers together from across campus, and you'll hear a small group of them today. These researchers are coming together to develop new ways of tackling the challenges that define our current moment and to rethink how we teach, research, and engage on issues that are felt across the globe in equally critical but different ways. I think that when we hear the word migration, we tend to think fairly narrowly in terms of particular species, human migration or bird or monarch butterfly migrations. But all living things move and they take other things with them and they reshape life along the way and then wherever they touch down. The incredible speed with which the novel coronavirus spread over the last four months is testament to the importance of understanding migration from this multi-species, multidisciplinary, and multi-temporal perspective. I think without exaggerating that it's fair to say that Cornell is one of the best places in the world to take a leading role in understanding this diversity of migrations. We already do so much excellent work on the topic. Almost all of our colleges work on migrations, specialize on some form of migrations, from the study of the legal aspects and law to the changing nature of work in ILR, to the environments in which people, plants, and animals migrate in cows, the history and motives of global migrations and arts, to the migration paths of large ungulates in the vet college, to community organizations in Ithaca, to engaged work, much of which has been increasingly supported by Engaged Cornell, to the Johnson Museum, the Botanical Gardens, the Lab of O, and more. But the Global Grand Challenges is our opportunity to build on this particularly Cornell spirit of collaboration to do more together. Even though Cornell really does encourage students and faculty to work across disciplines and department, um, departmental boundaries, our default mode is still understandably to base ourselves within single disciplines and to focus on issues that emerge out of the literature from that discipline. We tend to train new scholars, our students, in ways that reflect those disciplinary conventions, even if we urge them to use our tools to break new ground. We also, I would argue, have historically been better at studying and even promoting stability or fixity than studying flux or building resilience in movement. For example, we study and build urban environments that are meant to last, even though extreme weather, rising sea levels, constant and growing in and out migration and geopolitical change, these call for cities that are flexible with demographics that can change year to year or even be called on to move entirely, as Wendy Erb will talk about today. What we hope to do with this Global Grand Challenge is to study migrations and to bring together these different disciplines, but also to transform the way that we understand, teach, and engage in our traditional fields of study by focusing on movement across species, across geographies, historical time periods, and disciplines. The study of migrations and our ability to address real world migration challenges is dramatically improved by this collaborative approach, one that can tackle existing problems, influence policy, and provide future leadership on migration issues. This is what we're counting on our alumni and students to do. Ultimately, the challenge is to make the world a better place. This is a huge topic migrations, and that's appropriate for a grand challenge. It's not always an easy topic, 
there are significant political implications, as we see all around us, to how we talk about migration and migrants. In a very small example um, that doesn't maybe have some of the political controversy that we're seeing today, but I worked in the Galapagos Islands for several years, and I always thought that blackberries were fairly uncontroversial. But when blackberry gets labeled an invasive species, then conservationists start intervening in property disputes and farmers normally um, not very um, politically active, farmers start lighting government trucks on fire. The fact that migration is a heated, complicated, and politically sensitive topic around the world, even more so today with coronavirus upon us, that it calls into question different kinds of migration, this is why we should work on it and work on it together. So with that, um, a big welcome to all of you. Uh, I'll turn it over to Rachel Riedel to introduce the panelists. And as we go forward, we'll have um, short presentations by each of the panelists and then about hopefully 20 minutes for questions at the end. I'll moderate questions. And if you see the Q&A um, button at the bottom of your screen, just hit that and type in questions. Everybody will see it and we will take them um, as we can. So Rachel is a distinguished political scientist and the incoming John S. Knight Director of the Mario Ainaudi Center for International Studies. Rachel. Thank you, Wendy. And thank you to everyone for your participation today, for joining us in this reunions event. It's really inspiring to see the interest and the engagement with this topic from all classes and across the university. It's exactly that spirit of inquiry and engagement that makes Cornell so well suited to undertake this bold initiative harnessing the strength of its diverse colleges and its fields of study, the strength of our approach to international studies, and bringing our leading scholars together in conversation to broaden their exposures and the impact of what we can achieve together. This current moment, the tumultuous context we are facing only underscores the necessity of our vision to contribute to a just and sustainable and connected world where differences are valued and exchange is encouraged. In this panel today about migrations, about a world on the move, we will discuss the interconnectedness of all living things and their movements. And we can celebrate our interconnectedness today virtually, even while the migration of pathogens keeps us physically remote. Our approach is distinctly international because we believe that researching and learning from the full range of experiences across the globe is a vital component of advancing knowledge and pushing the frontiers of understanding. We seek to overcome the silos that block us from taking the important questions of our time and to remove barriers to our own perceptions that keep us from seeing things in new ways, from evolving, learning, and contributing. Over the last year, this Grand Challenge initiative seeded 14 multidisciplinary collaborations tackling the complex global issue of migration. In addition to those that you will hear about today, we have a research team representing the Lab of Ornithology, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, the College of Agriculture or of Architecture, Art and Planning, whose faculty are in analyzing the social and ecological impacts of physically relocating the capital city of Indonesia, Jakarta. And that you will hear a bit more about as, as Wendy mentioned. We have students who are now doing a virtual internship with partners in Ghana to focus on sea turtle migration. We also have a research team engaging students on border spaces and environmental justice, including working with local community partners. Faculty in science and technology studies and in CALS are working together to address the relationship between climate change, peace and conflict, and migration in our contemporary world. And we have a partnership between faculty and the College of Veterinary Medicine to lead a series of interdisciplinary workshops with researchers from Weill Medical, China, and Hong Kong to ask an ultimate question, why do new global infectious diseases keep emerging? Where do they come from? And how can we address their rise and impact? So yes, this research is certainly relevant. It's certainly critical. And it reflects multi-species awareness and our connectivity. In addition to many other exciting projects, in aggregate, we are establishing Cornell as a global site for comparative multi-species interdisciplinary research into how mobility shapes our social and natural worlds and as a leading center for questions related to climate change, international policy, regional conflict, and understandings of community 
well-being, development, justice, sustainability, and critically, understanding and shaping the future. We hope that this discussion today presents an opportunity for you to learn and engage, and we welcome your participation. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Eric Tagliocoso is the John Stombug Professor of, Hist of History in the History Department at Cornell, and he has written on the migration of people and material in and through Southeast Asia, including smugglers, pilgrims, and others over the past several centuries. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel and Wendy, for uh, asking me to come along today. And it's nice to meet all of you, even though I can't see any of you. Um, I'm going to just be talking for about six or seven minutes about the history of migration. This is something very interesting to me as I'm a historian uh, and I teach about Southeast Asia in the history department here. Um, I've been interested in the movement of people across global landscapes for a long time and Southeast Asia is one of the hinges of Asia that allows us to see these things between the Indian Ocean, the South China Sea and the Pacific Ocean. And I'm also one of four scholars that are doing currently the Cambridge History of Global Migration, which was a huge sprawling effort on a planetary scale, as you see here, to try to rewrite the history of human migration uh, across the world over the last 500 years. Um, so thinking about these things today is very useful to me uh, professionally and uh, is also something I've been thinking about for a long time. Maybe we can go to the next slide. So, I'm going to talk just in three brief parts for today's uh, uh, conversation. First, thinking about the earliest periods of human migration. Second, thinking about medieval and early modern migration. And third and finally, thinking a little bit about modern migration into our own time. Now to do this, we need to get the insights of many different people, as Rachel and Wendy said, from many different disciplines. So in fact, our friends, the ethno astronomers have told us that people were actually using outrigger canoes like this one to move across wide ocean spaces for a very long time. They used the stars to navigate by, not any kinds of maps that we think of in present day terms. If we could have the next slide. Ethnolinguists tell us how far these canoes were actually moving. So if you see Southeast Asia more or less in the middle of this image, uh, people were moving in these canoes all the way to the east as far away as Hawaii and even Easter Island off the coast of Latin America and moving west all the way to Madagascar off the coast of East Africa. So it's an incredible span. This is all one language group called Austronesian and it was seeded through these oceanic voyages over several thousand years. Now, if we're thinking about those Western migrations to Madagascar, maybe we could have the next slide. How did people actually uh, uh, come from Indonesia to Africa? Well, they needed to have food on the rafts that they took across the middle latitudes of the Indian Ocean. We tend to think of bananas as being the quintessential African crop, but they actually were transported from Southeast Asia on these rafts. And crop scientists are, have been able to tell us this by sequencing the genomes of uh, different kinds of banana species. What were people actually listening to on those rafts when they moved from Indonesia to Africa? Maybe we could have the next slide. Well, our, friend, the, our friends in uh, ethnomusicology tell us that actually the xylophone was something else that was moving along the way while people were eating bananas and studying the stars moving across these ocean pathways. Uh, this is what they were listening to along the way. And finally, maybe one last slide for this early period. Of course, and this is something that Wendy referenced in her earliest remarks, there's also DNA moving across the planet too. Uh, we know from geneticists, for example, that if you go to Madagascar, where I went for the first time last summer, it's quite amazing to be on the western side of the island facing Africa. People have typically Bantu African phenotypes for their facial features, but on the eastern side of Madagascar facing the Indian Ocean, people look Javanese. It's just amazing. That's 2,000 years of history of DNA moving across these oceans with these migrations. Let's move to the medieval and early modern period. Now, one of the people that was thinking about these things during that time was Leonardo da Vinci and this famous drawing of Vitruvian Man or Luomo Vitruviano. This was drawn during the Renaissance and imagine my surprise this past year when I was able to teach a class with Steve Squires. Steve Squires was Carl Sagan's uh, replacement in the astronomy department and unfortunately we lost him this year. He's become Jeff Bezos's uh, chief scientist at Blue Origin trying to get uh, um, 
trying to get rockets up again towards uh, the moon and Mars. But I was able to teach a class with him, the history of exploration, where I taught about everything moving by land and sea. And Steve taught about everything going up off the planet. Imagine my surprise that the one slide we had in common was Vitruvian Man. And Steve was talking about it as it was brought on this capsule out to the stars, just in case we might in encounter anybody out there. Uh, but I was thinking about it in medieval and early modern terms, and that was the one slide we had in common. Now, of course, if we do think about the medieval and early modern period, there were all kinds of people moving. Next slide, please. One of these people was Marco Polo. Marco Polo traveled very long distances in the 13th century, possibly all the way to China. He says he did, but we're not entirely sure. In the 14th century, next slide, please. Ibn Battuta, the great Moroccan jurist, traveled possibly three times as far as, as Marco Polo and also says that he made it all the way to China. Again, we're not entirely sure. And in the 15th century, the Chinese Admiral Zheng He in the early Ming Dynasty led seven expeditions south and west across the Indian Ocean, one of which brought a giraffe back to the court of early Ming China. So these are old world examples of these kinds of migrations. And growing up, we probably, growing up in the United States, we probably only heard about Marco Polo's, although there's been new advances in multiculturalism that allow children now to hear about all of these voyages. If we move into the 16th century, we can think about several other people moving west instead of east. Hernan Cortez, among the Spanish, went to Mexico and eventually was able to defeat the Aztecs in Mexico. And at the more or less the same time, next slide, please, Francisco Pizarro did the same thing in Peru with the Incas. These were new world voyages and migrations that came after them in the 16th century. But here again, migration was also taking place on a smaller scale, not just these people moving, but the microbes that moved with them. That image has deep resonance to what we're all thinking about now, but that's not COVID-19, that's smallpox. And somewhere between 65 and 85% of all Amerindian populations in the new world were killed not by the superior weapons or organization or quote unquote civilization of the West, but by smallpox, which decimated Amerindian populations. That brings us to the last part of this quick talk, which is the modern period. So I've talked about the Portuguese and the Spanish moving and migrating in the 16th century, the Dutch in the 17th century, the French in the 18th century. This is a map of the British moving in the 19th century, and we can see why so many parts of the world actually speak English as a result of the wake of the British Empire across large spaces of the planet. Next slide, please. A colleague and friend of mine, now sadly deceased, Adam McKeon, a historian at Columbia, wrote a beautiful book about this called Melancholy Order, uh, Asian Migration and the Globalization of Borders. It's gotta be the best title of a book I've ever come across because it talks about 19th century migration moving across these spaces, uh, again, across the planet. One of the things that came up from this is that people were moving to places like our own country, to Ellis Island in New York. These were comparatively rich countries moving people to comparatively poor ones. The historian Alfred Crosby called these movements to the neo-Europes, the US and Canada and North America, Australia and New Zealand in the Antipodes, and Argentina and Chile in South America, places that looked and felt like Europe that were not the tropics, which would have killed Europeans through their own diseases. By the 20th century, we see a reverse of this. Instead of people moving from rich countries to poor countries, it is more the example of people moving from poor countries to rich ones, like this image of Africans in the Mediterranean, the so-called soft underbelly of Europe, uh, this is what we see more in our own time of the 20th into the 21st century. And I want to focus just on one, uh, one actual human being among this multitude of human beings. This is an image that probably many of you have seen, is the image of Alan Kurdi, who uh, as a tiny little boy died in one of these Mediterranean migration attempts from the Middle East to Europe, and whose uh, image came across the planet and affected all of us. There is a human face to this, therefore, but in this image, no face to be seen. Let me just end with one last image, and it is indeed the first image that we started with. In five months' time, we are all going to be making our own migrations to the ballot box, and I would never dream to tell you what to do when you get there. 
but that's because you already know what to do. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Eric. Now I want to move on to our next panelist and participant today, which is Wendy Erb. Wendy is the American Association of University Women Postdoctoral Fellow at the Center for Conservation Bioacoustics in the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. She is a tropical field and primate behavioral ecologist studying wild primates and their habitats in the jungles of Indonesia. Wendy is most passionate about research that integrates the natural and social sciences to develop conservation plans that incorporate the values and needs of local people and connect people with forests, wildlife, science, and each other. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you to all of you for being here today. I'm very excited to have this opportunity to share um, the research that we're hoping to get underway um, and trying to sort out interesting ways to do uh, some of this work remotely. Uh, so the title of our project is Mega City Migration, uh, the Social Ecological Impacts of Relocating Indonesia's Capital City to a Global Biocultural Hotspot. Next slide, please. And so we all know that across the planet, humans are confronting anthropogenic climate change. And here in this map, we can see the proportion of populations at the national scale that are vulnerable to sea level rise worldwide, where darker uh, color is indicating greater risk. And as a result, millions of people are predicted to migrate within their own countries to escape the slow onset impacts of rising temperatures, rising sea levels, and extreme weather patterns. Next slide, please. So one Southeast Asian island, of, uh, nation of islands, Indonesia, will become, oh, sorry, the previous slide, will become among the first to initiate a climate migration by relocating its capital city. So plagued by pollution, sinking rapidly, and flooding annually, Jakarta is the most vulnerable of Asia's coastal megacities to climate change due to its high population density and exposure to environmental hazards and sea level rise. Next slide, please. So in response to these threats, just this past August, Indonesia's President Jokowi announced the decision to move the capital from densely populated Java to a resource rich region on Borneo in hopes of reducing some of these risks while more fairly distributing political power and contributing to a national vision for green growth throughout the archipelago. Next. Harboring some of the world's largest tropical forests, Borneo is one of the richest and most imperiled cultural and biodiversity hotspots on earth. This region is home to dozens of indigenous groups um, as are sketched out in the map on the right as well as countless endemic plants and animals, including some of the iconic megafauna pictured here, like Irrawaddy dolphins, proboscis monkeys, Sumatran rhinos, and orangutans. And all of these populations have already been impacted by extractive resource activities going back many decades. Next. So in contrast to densely populated Jakarta, the new capital will be located within a quarter million hectare landscape in East Borneo that's shared by diverse communities, multinational corporations, and endangered species habitat. So with construction um, initially planned to begin this year and millions of people to be relocated to the map to the new capital in the coming years, it's clear that this migration will result in increased human population density and cultural diversity, as well as an expanded infrastructure and large scale land use changes. And so to understand the cascading social and ecological impacts of these far reaching changes, uh, we really need to take an interdisciplinary multi species and system level investigation. Um, and you're already on the next slide. Uh, so our project will attempt to investigate this complex social ecological system by working with local partners in East Borneo to conduct mixed methods research that integrates social, ecological, and spatial methods. So specifically, we'll utilize ethnographic and participatory research to study a representative range of communities 
with a particular interest um, in their relationships to the surrounding landscape, including their livelihoods and local ecological knowledge, as well as the perceptions of this migration related change and its impacts. Next. Complementing this, we will combine GIS data sets and bioacoustics, which is an approach that uses uh, sounds from the forest, from the environment, to understand wildlife communities and ecosystems. And we'll combine these data sets to study forest cover, land use, and biodiversity in this system. Next. And so to bring things together in partnership with local collaborators, we'll identify study sites together in regions that have both high value for humans and the environment or so-called social ecological hotspots, selecting sites that reflect the area's cultural and ecological diversity, as well as a representative range of some of the past, current, and projected drivers of change to better understand how human and non-human communities exist and interact before, during, and after this historic plan migration. Next, please. So our collaborative research team will be headed by faculty from the Lab of Ornithology, who I'm representing today. Um, so Dr. Holger Klink from the Department of City and Regional Planning, Dr. Victoria Beard, and Department of Natural Resources. Dr. Shorna Allred in collaboration with the Southeast Asia program. Uh, field research will be led by two postdoc researchers, myself, an ecologist, and Walker DePew, an anthropologist, um, who together have conducted a combined 20 years of field research in Indonesia, most of it focused on the island of Borneo. And so we're working to build our Indonesian collaborative team right now, and we've already established a partnership with faculty at the premier university in East Borneo, Universitas Muluarman, in the forestry department's wildlife ecology lab with Chandra Boer and Rustam, as well as the Center for Social Forestry uh, by, with Dr. Simone de Boom. Next, please. So wrapping up to look at the big picture, through this integrative and collaborative research agenda, we explicitly aim for this project to be inclusive and adaptive with contributions that span and integrate academic disciplines. And by collaborating with communities to integrate local knowledge, we strive for this work to be centered on the ethics of sharing and relations of equity. And last slide, please. And ultimately, we aim to establish a long-term research team that will co-produce high-quality outputs of scientific and policy relevant, relevance, in particular by combining bioacoustics and ethnography. We're excited about the possibility of developing engaged, locally relevant approaches to understanding the cultural and ecological impacts of migration and development. And we hope that this project will lay the groundwork for a long-term longitudinal international interdisciplinary collaboration that will expand and develop as this migration unfolds, while also providing a strong evidentiary basis for social and environmental policy, both in Indonesia and worldwide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, our next panelist today is Steve Yellor, who teaches immigration at the Cornell Law School as a professor of immigration practice. He also co-directs the law school's Asylum Appeals Clinic and co-authors a 21-volume immigration law treatise. In his spare time, he and his wife hike the gorges of Ithaca. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat> First slide, please. I'm going to talk about a project that we're doing across Cornell to advance the health of immigrants by increasing knowledge of their legal rights as it concerns public benefits through digital tools. Uh, next slide. So this is a project that is funded by the Cornell Migrations Initiative. I'm doing it with Ganesha Carr on the right there, who is an assistant professor of anesthesiology at Weill Cornell Medicine, and also co-director of the Weill Cornell Center for Human Rights. And we're also working with Deborah Estrin, who you see on the left there, who is a professor of computer science at Cornell Tech, who has started a health tech hub there, and is also uh, a MacArthur Genius Award winner on the side. We're also working with Jane Powers, who is the project director of ACT for Youth Center for Community Action at the Bronfenbrenner Center for Translational Research. I'm actually wearing two hats here today, 
because in addition to our own project, Cornell has asked me and Venetia Carr to co-lead a research lab coordinated through the INAUDI Center. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, the Migrations Initiative is supporting researchers and students from across Cornell, and we are going to be coordinating with them to try to bring to you the best science and policy advice, all tackling the complex global issue of migration. Next slide. So for our particular project, um, immigrants across the United States are decreasing their engagement with healthcare providers and with systems, and that is resulting in deepening healthcare disparities. This may be the result of governmental policy or a misunderstanding of policy, such as a new so-called public charge rule, which came about in February of this year. And it says that if immigrants uh, take certain public benefits, they may be at risk of deportation. For example, pregnant women are now not accessing vital prenatal care and postnatal care to which they are still legally entitled and thereby placing themselves and their babies at risk of medical complications. Children are not accessing critical preventive medical care or vaccinations because they fear deportation or separation from their families. Next slide. So this new rule restricting public benefits is confusing, even to us immigration lawyers. As the slide shows, uh, not all immigrants are subject to this new rule. The green dots at the bottom show people who are immigrants, such as they have a green card or if they have certain characteristics like an asylum, then they do not have to worry about the public charge rule but other people uh, in red at the top do have to worry about public charge and the gray over there shows people where it's unclear whether the public charge rule applies to them. Next slide. Even if you are subject to the new rule, you still are entitled to re receive certain benefits. So some benefits like food stamps, which is officially known as Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and Section 8 housing benefits are included in the new rule, meaning that immigrants should not access that, uh, those kinds of benefits. Next slide. But other benefits, such as school lunches and Head Start and the WIC program, are not included in the new public charge rule, meaning that immigrants can legally access those benefits without fear of deportation. But understanding those differences is hard even for lawyers and explaining those differences to immigrants is even harder, in part because it's not, uh, if you take a benefit, you're automatically deportable. Instead, the immigration agency has taken a totality of the circumstances approach. So uh, nobody can say definitively, if I accept one certain benefit, I will be deported. So how can we help immigrants? Let's go to the next slide and see if we can figure it out. The goal of our research is to improve the health of immigrants in the United States. Our central hypothesis is that increased knowledge about legal rights may increase engagement between immigrants and healthcare systems. The Migrations Initiative has funded us to test this hypothesis by doing qualitative surveys of doctors and immigrant patients at Weill Cornell Medicine. We hope to do three things. First, gain an evidence-based understanding of the major barriers to immigrant health care. Second, develop digital tools to address those gaps. And third, pilot those solutions in a feasibility study to generate data for a subsequent clinical trial that would be funded through the National Institutes of Health. This is a huge issue. Some experts estimate that up to one half of all new immigrants may be affected by this new public charge rule. Even families who are unaffected by the new rule, such as those already with green cards or who are naturalized U.S. citizens, are avoiding public benefit programs to which they are entitled out of fear and confusion. For example, for example the Kaiser Family Foundation has found that nearly half of all health centers nationwide have reported significant numbers of immigrant families refusing or withdrawing from Medicaid because of this new rule. U.S. citizens are also, also adversely affected. 50% of immigrants live in communities that have immigrant populations of at least 10%. Immigrants' widespread disenrollment and impaired healthcare access are likely to decrease funding for local and regional health systems, affecting the health access of millions of Americans. 
and billions of dollars in revenue to hospitals and clinics will be lost. This has become even more important since February with the coronavirus, because it's more important than ever that both immigrants and citizens fully access our healthcare systems. But many immigrants fear being tested for coronavirus because of this new public charge rule. Our research aligns with the overall goals of Cornell's grand challenge. When Wendy and others requested research proposals, they wrote, the Migrations Initiative aims to collaborate, cultivate collaborations that advance science, scholarship, teaching, outreach, and engagement in ways that generate new insights. We hope to provide a stronger evidentiary basis for policy and to place Cornell at the forefront of migration studies around the world. This research box does all that. This project sits at the nexus of law, medicine, technology, and public outreach. The faculty are from four different parts of Cornell, law, medicine, Cornell Tech, and the social sciences. Without the Migrations Initiative, we would not have known about each other or started this collaboration. By surveying immigrant patients, we hope to gather facts to influence policy and to make sure that immigrants know which health care benefits they can and cannot use. And by developing digital tools for immigrants like smartphone apps, uh, we hope to make that information easily and widely available. Thank you. Back to you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Steve. That was really interesting. To our last participant, Felice Garib studies both internal and international migration. She has worked on the rural urban migration in Thailand when the country led the world in economic growth in the 1980s and on international migration from Mexico to the United States, the largest sustained migration flow in the world. Felice is a migrant multiple times over herself. She first migrated as a baby from communist Bulgaria to Turkey with her family, and then she came to the United States to study engineering at Princeton. There she discovered her love for social sciences and switched from engineering to sociology. In her work, she combines the formal and quantitative focus of engineering with the qualitative and historical approach of sociology. Thank you, Felice. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this virtual campus meeting. I'm really Glad to be included in this initiative and also in this meeting where we can share um, what we're planning to do. And I only have a single slide. So this project only came about because of Cornell and because the unique role this university has in bringing basic science together with real life impact and real life policy relevant questions. And uh, so Migrations Grants Initiative actually supported uh, this project. Uh, and uh, our team is made up of um, two other social scientists um, other than myself. So I'm a sociologist uh, by training. I have a quantitative background, but I rarely have collaborated with economists until now. And I feel very lucky to have met Nancy Chow, who is a theoretical economist, which means she works with equations most of the time and not with data. And Ariel Ortiz Bobea, who is an agricultural economist. So he worries about crop production and how weather affects crops and migration as a result of that. Um, so I have studied Mexican migration for the past 10 years, and I'm embarrassed to say until now, I haven't considered the environment as a factor in migration, and which is very short-sighted now that we've heard Wendy's talk. In the future, a lot of human migration will be driven by environmental vulnerability. So what we're trying to do in this project is to bring together for the first time very fine-grained data on weather fluctuations historically going back 50 years using data from satellites and following weather day to day in every four square kilometer um, place space on earth. And we're combining these data with surveys on immigrants. So what we're trying to understand is what we've overlooked until now. Until now, we always thought of migration as driven by economic incentives, like wage differences between two countries that compel people to move. Or we've talked about historical patterns like the ones Eric mentioned between you know, colonial powers and, uh, and other countries, but uh, we haven't really looked into weather fluctuations and in the environment how, and how that's become an impetus for migration throughout history. So we're trying to do that now and our goal is to help our global community address the future challenge of environmentally um, 
motivated migration around the world. So we start with Mexico. And as Rachel mentioned in her introduction, the movement between Mexico and the US is the largest sustained international flow between any two countries. So it's really, really important. And it's also a flow for which a lot of information has been collected to date. So the survey data that we're using actually gives us information on over 150,000 individuals in Mexico. And it covers over 55 years. So starting in 1965, we can trace back mobility to the US until today. But as I said, until now, we haven't considered how this relates to changes in weather or the disasters that different regions have experienced. So the maps that you see on the slide are basically trying to give you a glimpse of what we can do with this data. So we've basically coded each Mexican state on this map with respect to prevalence of US migrations. So the share of their population who have migrated to the US. So the darker gray ones are uh, places that send immigrants to the US. And then you see the same map replicated with temperature at really hot places over the last 20 years and precipitation. So what we're trying to see is can we link these things and can we understand how people have responded to weather changes throughout the past five decades? And then can we use this information to predict what's gonna happen in the future? Who's gonna be the most vulnerable and can we do anything to mitigate this vulnerability? So we're kind of bringing our different disciplinary backgrounds and skills to this project. And first, what we wanna understand is, can we use um, this very fine grained data and really cutting edge tools um, from computer science to predict migration flows. In other words, you know, there's huge um, a, a development in computer science these days with artificial intelligence. And the promise of this uh, developing um, area is its predictive power. Um, and so we're using these methods to understand, can we use the weather fluctuations, day-to-day -day fluctuations to predict migration flows um, over time? These methods are great, but they don't help you understand why you're able to predict what you're predicting. So the next step is to think more carefully about what are the linkages that take us from changes in weather to individual decisions to migrate. So one thing we can think of is agricultural production. So clearly if it doesn't rain or if there are severe droughts in a year, that affects agricultural production. And in communities, this means that people will not be able to get their livelihoods and they might be pushed to migrate. And actually in our field work in Mexico, these days, this is a common story. So last summer, we talked to coffee producers in Southern Mexico and they were talking about how it didn't rain last year so they couldn't hire workers. A farmer said she usually hires 30 people but this year she hired only one. So everyone who wasn't hired had to go to the US. So clearly this is kind of part of um, uh, an underlying reason um, a, a, for migration flows here. And finally, we just don't want to look at it only from an environmental perspective. We want to understand how individuals respond to one another. So these days, we talk about virus and the diffusion of virus, how one person can um, you know, pass the virus on to other people. And a lot of behaviors are like this, a lot of social behaviors. And migration is no exception. If you live in a community where a lot of people have migrated before, it's very easy for you to learn from these people, follow in their footsteps, get help. And that's why we see this historical path to migration. If a community is a heavy center of migrants, the chances are that future migration will also come from these communities. So we'll try to understand these social dynamics in relation to responses to weather. And, you know, I feel like this kind of research could have only happened at Cornell, even without this Migrations Grand Initiative, which was huge in bringing our team together. But Cornell is so unique in bringing together people who are interested in very academic questions with people who are working with farmers on the ground and, um, and policymakers. So we feel very lucky um, to be supported through this project. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists. I feel really lucky to have such wonderful colleagues um, and to get to, to listen to the presentations. 
So we have about uh, 14, 15 minutes for questions. We have a few questions um, that have come in. Again, just hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and send us um, any questions. We had a great comment from Marlene Kui asking about participation, how to keep up with the projects or with the initiative as a whole. And I thank you for that question. It's like we planted you. Um, we'll follow up um, with all of you with an email about how to stay in touch and um, how to get in touch if you want to get involved. So thank you very much for that. There are some really big questions um, packed into uh, this question here by Cheryl Wasserman. So maybe I'll pull it apart a little bit. And the problem with having such an interdisciplinary group of colleagues on the panel is that um, it's hard to know exactly who to direct the questions to because they touch different disciplines in different ways and everybody has different takes on these. So I will just throw it open um, and we'll try to have people jump in uh, one at a time. The question from Cheryl, the way that I want to ask it is what happens when non-human migrations cross national boundaries? So national boundaries, of course, are relatively fixed with some notable exceptions, but migrations by definition are not, particularly um, uh, non-human migrations. So human migrations can be contained in certain ways, but it's very difficult to contain plant, animal, other types of migrations. So if you could talk a little bit just um, in history or at the present about that relationship between um, um, migratory flows and national boundaries. Rachel, do you want to jump in on that at first? Sure, I'm happy to. It's such an interesting question. And I would just say that to me, what struck me um, in, in reading it was the way in which boundaries themselves, as we think of, are quite fixed and static in our contemporary world. And we think of them as really enduring or something to be fought over um, for political power. But historically and across different um, spatial locations across the globe, boundaries, territorial boundaries even meant quite different things. It could mean control over people in terms of how far people could migrate or, or walk within a certain number of days to show what, what areas one had control over or certain types of um, animals and resources that could be used different during different climactic seasons. And so I think that that um, question really ties in well to thinking about how migration itself determines the boundaries that we see today and helps to shape what we think of as contemporary nation states, but those themselves are the results of migrations and are continually contested. Um, and so that's the kind of the political side of it that helps tie together the physical um, components. Wendy, do you want to jump in here too? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a little bit of a migrant into migration studies myself. Um, and although the work that we're going to be conducting in East Borneo does not cross any international boundaries, of course, the island of Borneo is shared by three different countries. Um, and it's hard to imagine that there won't be impacts across the border. That said, on the scale of the project that we're developing, uh, we had our first call with our collaborators um, to really start like putting the pieces together of how we're gonna do this work. And one of the big um, opportunities that came out of that discussion uh, was the thought about using corridors to move across not international boundaries, but land use boundaries, different land owners, different land uh, use types, and how we can investigate the, the use of those corridors by humans and non-humans, how they move across that landscape in response uh, to resource availability. Um, so I think that's gonna be a really exciting avenue um, of study that's emerging quite organically out of this work. So wonderful question, thank you. Anyone else want to? Yeah, Eric, you're muted, but please jump. Yeah, sure. Um, no, I'm just going to jump on what both Rachel and Wendy said, because I think those were really good answers. And just thinking about this historically, one of the things to notice is that, you know, traditionally in large parts of the world, wars were not fought over boundaries. They were fought over people. So uh, there was plenty of land for, for lots of, uh, for a kingdom to have land. What, what there was not plenty of was people. So I agree with, with uh, Rachel's answer in, in talking about that, that what we conceive of as modern 
political boundaries. This is really something that goes back to kind of the Treaty of Westphalia, and it's, it's only a few hundred years old and primarily European in designation. But in places like Southeast Asia, again, just to, to jump on what Wendy was saying too, if you were uh, uh, a ruler in most of Southeast Asia's history, you weren't eyeing somebody else's land covetously. You were, you were eyeing their people. So the fact that these people might actually migrate of their own volition towards your kingdom would be something often very, very welcome. Uh, and that is very much opposite of what we see now in certain parts of the world where the idea of migrants coming to one's country is seen as a threat. Actually, that would have been seen as a boon for long periods in, in human history. At the same time, I would jump in and, and working in Brazil uh, and living in the United States, the way that frontiers, borders and frontiers shape political histories. So Brazil is very much a country that has been shaped by the idea of the Amazonian frontier as a potential, a potential for development, a potential then for conservation. Um, so I do think um, the territorial dimensions of a nation state also shape the political dynamics. Um, so Cheryl's, the end of Cheryl's question, which I did break into two, um, and she rightly um, wanted the whole question to be answered, the question of what impact does uh, migration have on the history of war? Does anybody else want to take that? I know, Eric, you touched on it. It's a big question. Okay, well, while you're thinking about that, I will um, ask Steve Niels Nielsen's question. Um, how much evidence is there that public benefits in the US have motivated people to move here legally or not? That's a good question. Uh, really very little evidence exists that people come here because of public benefits. We've had a rule against allowing immigrants to rely on public benefits since the 1880s, even before, um, any other early immigration laws. And since 1996, when we restricted our welfare laws generally, immigrants have been ineligible for most public benefits um, even for five years after they get a green card. So um, pe people think that immigrants are here for getting on the public dole, that is not the case. But this role, rule, this new rule that took effect this year goes even farther. In the past, public benefits limitations were primarily limited to cash benefits, like general assistance. And now we are adding non-cash benefits to the public charge rule. And it's more the confusion than actually anybody doing anything wrong that is causing consternation. And that's what our project is trying to dispel. Thank you very much. Um, and then Eric, Sabrina Smith wants to know if you can recommend a primer for global human migration and whether the Cambridge study is currently available. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that is a great question. And that leads me into a segue to, for a, a primer for the book. Uh, we just, we're just working on this now. There's four scholars um, and it's going to be produced by Cambridge as part of this Cambridge Histories uh, group. So it's Cambridge History of Human Migration. Um, it, it'll probably be another couple of years, unfortunately, before that'll be produced, but then it, it will be have something like, I think it's 65 scholars from all over the world writing with their own uh, particular linguistic competence, archival competence, fieldwork competence about the, the global history of human migration uh, on a planetary scale over roughly the last five to 600 years. So I'm afraid it's not out yet, but um, in, in about two years, it should be, yeah. Well, maybe Sabrina is volunteering to help you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, no, on the welfare use question. So in our data, actually, we have this question asking immigrants if they use any services. And actually, the usage is less than, you know, uh, it's negligible, uh, less than you would expect, especially among undocumented immigrants. It's it's scary for them to use these services. So documented migrants who have a right to use them, use them, but their rate of use is actually lower than uh, the native born population and undocumented migrants actually use them even less. And this is not just us, our data, but the National Academies also uh, did a study of this and the finding is similar, that uh, this is not a reason driving migration at all. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question and then we'll 
we'll finish up with just a last comment from the panelists if anybody has something they want to conclude with. But maybe to Rachel and to Eric, I'm wondering about the range of different attitudes towards migration, maybe across historical periods for Eric and across nation states um, for Rachel. Can you, can you talk at all about some of those different approaches? Maybe Rachel first. Sure. Um, what I think is interesting, so in terms of looking at Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where I um, study and, and research, um, but also looking comparatively across the world, um, what's really striking is that the perceptions of immigrants are never static across all categories of immigrants, all types of immigrants who might be moving, and even the conception of who is an immigrant and who belongs, who is autochthonous, uh, varies over time. And those are struggles of narratives um, over who has the right to belong and who makes those types of claims. So what I find quite interesting in terms of shaping attitudes towards immigration, as we see in some recent um, survey data collected by my colleague in the government department, Tom Popinski, for example, in the United States, is that it can be driven by partisan position, that some of our information and opinions are shaped by the news, the information that we see, receive, and, and partisan inputs that even shape how we see uh, the question of, of immigration. It can also be shaped by different hierarchies and ordering of who we think immigrants are. So even in national power structures and institutions, we have different classes of, of visa regimes. Who is coming in as a highly skilled worker, where we think those people are coming in from, and different types of modes uh, of arrival um, and different types of legal stat status. So all of those elements shape um, individuals' perceptions of, of immigration and immigrants and are very fluid over time. Thanks. Eric. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with that uh, entirely. And I think, you know, um, the example I gave is something that goes back a, a thousand years into Southeast Asian history, but we don't have to go back so far or go so far away, right? Just thinking about the United States and how the changing rhetoric of who a migrant is and what they mean in the context of migration. I mean, probably uh, a lot of folks on the, on the panel right here, including myself, are not really young enough to, uh, are not old enough to remember this, but just what the, what the rhetoric would have been about uh, John, John F. Kennedy becoming president, the idea of an Irish Catholic becoming president of the United States seemed impossible for a number of generations of Americans. And this is to say nothing of what Barack Obama's election would have meant to others. So I think there is no ontological category of the migrant. Uh, I think Rachel's exactly right. It changes, it changes in time and space. Uh, what would be interesting, and maybe this is a, a, a kind of a nice way to, to kind of uh, move into the sunset with the panel is to think about what this is gonna look like in the future. Uh, so maybe not a hundred years ago with Irish and Italian migrations to the United States or the Chinese migrations who, who actually really built the railroads, who won the West in this country. It's, it's really the Chinese who won the West uh, who, who, who allowed that to happen by building the railroads. Um, but thinking about what this would look like 100 years from now and how the narrative might change again, uh, that, would, that would really be fascinating to me. Well, I think that's a great way to end. Does everybody want to take um, uh, just 30 seconds to close and maybe think about what some of the future of either the project or the theme that you're working on would look like? maybe in order. So Eric has um, already spoken. Do you wanna speak again? No, I'm happy to give up my turn. <laughs> okay, so I'll turn to Wendy. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it was really fascinating to hear these diverse perspectives uh, this afternoon, um, speaking on a personal level about, about this program and the opportunity that it's providing me as a early career scholar to start to situate my work into this much larger conversation hap happening across diverse scholars and to take the lessons that I'm learning in these conversations and these approaches to bring back to my own field, to my own discipline, um, a sort of migration of knowledge um, is really exciting. Thanks. Um, Steve. I echo what Wendy just said. I've already learned a lot by collaborating with people and other 
parts of Cornell that I did not know about before. So that's already been one benefit from this initiative. I think this advances uh, by the provost's goal of radical collaboration and one of the things that Cornell is particularly good at. And I'm excited to see what more we can accomplish in the coming years through this initiative. Thanks, Steve. Felice. I'll just say thumbs up to what everyone said. It's been amazing. And, you know, thinking about, you know, what Eric has opened this panel with, you know, it, migration is as old as human history. And even today in the New York Times, you read about people considering moving to the suburbs because of the coronavirus. So this is an adaptation mechanism that we humans have and will continue to have this. Uh, so looking at it from this perspective, I think is really helpful. And also realizing that it's not just immigrants who are coming here to meet their needs, but we also need them. A lot of the frontline workers today are immigrant workers. So I think the coronavirus pandemic actually puts all of these things into perspective. So again, very grateful for the support and very grateful for this collegial community here at Cornell. Great. Well, thank you all again to all of the panelists. Thank you to all of the participants. I really second what everybody has said that I think migration is one of the defining issues of our time. And I think that this sort of interdisciplinary perspective will help us to understand the relationship between people and plants and animals and microbes and ideas and how they shape the context we live in. So thank you all and I look forward to being back in touch.